want to welcome you all to our 2012 Graph Expo session, 2020, The Future Role of Newspapers. As I wrote in the cover story of the issue that's available here at the show, there's no question that this decade will represent the most dramatic, some would say traumatic, transformation this industry has ever known. That said, the role newspapers will play in the next few years and leading up to 2020 will be much the same as it is today. Consumers will still look to newspapers to provide them with the news and information they need. Advertisers will be looking for papers to link them to the customers to buy their products. How that, how that information will be distributed, however, will embrace a wide spectrum from print to handheld devices that are just being developed. This rapid pace of technological change will continue to put strain on newspaper executives and the vendors that supply this industry. But finding the answer is critical to ensure the newspaper industry remains vital, not just in 2020, but in the decades to come. To help give us some perspective on where the industry is headed and some guidance about the external trends that are shaping the printing industry, we're fortunate to have with us today three insightful speakers. They will talk about a wide variety of topics from using digital press technology to produce newspapers to understanding the critical steps newspaper managers need to take as they navigate the next few years. Our first speaker will talk about the use of digital press technology and how his firm is using a digital press today to produce newspapers. Rod Winscott is president of the NewsWeb Corporation Printing Division. He lives in North Aurora, a Chicago suburb, with his wife Christine and three children. Also has two adult children living in the Chicago area. Rod joined NewsWeb 18 years ago, coming from New Jersey, where he was vice president and general manager of Able Printing Shopper's Guide, and he was with USA Today prior to that. He's held board positions on a number of Chicago-based organizations, including the formerly known printing industry of Illinois and Indiana. Rod is also involved with the Graphic Technology Advisory Board for the College of DuPage and was recently appointed to the State of Illinois Curriculum Revitalization Project Task Force. NewsWeb is a commercial printer based here in Chicago, specializes in newspapers, journals, and a variety of cold web products. In 1998, as a response to its clients' increased need for four-color printing, NewsWeb expanded its press capacity. In 2004, NewsWeb began looking at digital web printing, but felt the technology had not reached the tipping point where smaller publishers could take advantage of it. Winscott said that he feels that if we're going to continue to offer our clients the most cost-effective and innovative method of producing their newspapers, we must offer the digital option. It will be important to educate our clients on the marketing and best utilization of digital printing. To help encourage the incorporation of this technology, NewsWeb plans to develop and hold clinics for their clients, which will demonstrate new and exciting revenue generation ideas for newspapers. Rod? Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here today. <clears throat> the theme of the session, 2020, the future of role of newspapers. For me, in order to look ahead, I need only to watch my 10-year-old son, who has a better comprehension and technical expertise on my iPhone and my iPad than I ever will. Then picture him at 20 and wonder what the world will hold for him. When I was 10, which was 1960, and then when I was 20, 1970, not much happened that was significant in the world of technology. It seems each subsequent decade has exponentially grown in both technology and the speed of marketing that technology. I expect the next 10 years will bring things only imagined at this point. What has been the largest single driving force that drove information in the past 10 years? In my mind, the advancement of digital communications. Cell phone technology, improvements in internet access have changed the way we communicate with each other the way we receive information, and the way we read a book. Most of us are accessible 24 hours a day via phone, email, and text, and in turn, we have come to expect that of other outlets accessible in the same way. 
In the year 2000, there were 109 million mobile phones in the U.S., and 43% of us used the Internet. Fast forward to 2011, the number of people with mobile phones has tripled to 333 million, and 78% of our population has found their way to the World Wide Web. <coughs> Darwin said it best, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that's most adaptable to change. I would like to think the role of newspapers will remain the same, providing news, advertising, and social opportunities to the reader now and in 2020. That is assuming that they too evolve to meet the needs of the readers and the advertisers. That evolution may, may mean developing new products made from blending conventional offset newspapers and digital variable data printing. We see now that newspapers are transforming and looking for new ways to reach out to the subscriber base. NewsWeb is and always has been a commercial printing company whose base of customers are local, ethnic, and alternative newspapers. Because our base circulations are small, they're pretty good at targeting their audience with the news and the advertising that is meaningful to the reader. That being said, we feel that the marketers and the advertisers will recognize that small newspapers can, by virtue of their intimacy with their marketplace, provide good reach into certain demographics. Readers' <clears throat> compelling need for specialized data lends itself to the digital printing when its ability to co be cost effective and generate small customized press runs. Newspapers have and will continue to transform according to the needs of the marketplace and the available technological advancements. If we look at the exponential growth of communications over the last 10 years and apply that same model going forward, what we may see, what may seem like science fiction could be reality. I don't think we will see that magnitude of change in newspapers, but there will be change. Newspapers continue to define their audience by reaching out to them with micro or hyper, hyper zones crafted to offer the local news and the local advertising for the large metro dailies. This approach has become almost commonplace. For the local community newspaper, it's costly and very cumbersome on a large offset press where plates and labor and waste may make printing a 500 copy zone a questionable proposition. Enter the digital press. <clears throat> The successful newspapers know what drives their readers is content they find useful and content that addresses their needs. They know that when they need to connect with and anticipate the needs of their audience. With the refinement of digital printing and digital web presses, newspapers have a tool which can, can help them service and any newly defined market with specialized news or advertising. The small daily newspaper will have the ability to better serve its community utilizing digital printing. Advertising clients can readily sample customers through variable data transfer of coupon data, QC codes, and contests which rely on the variable data mix. NewsWeb's digital press can generate a page range from four pages tab to 15, at 15,000 copies an hour to a 72-page broadsheet at 950 pieces an hour in five sections, if so desired. This flexibility allows the newspapers to print affordability, customized standalone products, or a section for a larger conventional publication. It addresses the problem of targeting local markets in both news and advertising. There have been huge jumps in technolo technology that does not that does nothing but transfer information from one data, from data from one person to another, and one person to place. This process has somewhat usurped the role of the traditional newspaper held for years. NewsWeb has been in the business for over 40 years, and we have seen some of our clients succeed and some fail. The common thread among them all is the struggle to evolve into what they perceive the reader and the advertiser is looking for. 
We must continually redefine our, the marketplace and then adapt. Newspapers are now forced to compete with the reader's time against not only television and radio news, but now the digital world where a person can surf their smartphone or smart pad and retrieve small or in-depth slices of news and other customer content. The need for on-demand or individual-centric news content is one of the compelling reasons we purchased our TKS Jet Leader. The other reason is that generally we see publisher circulation figures decline as they try to contend with how to present these smaller hypermarkets and microzones in order to effectively compete for the reader's time. We see the ability to produce large page counts, small press runs, and news, uh, small press run newspapers as a desirable fit. Chicago is the third largest city in the United States with an MSA population of 9.5 million. We feel that Chicago is a very desirable market and as a central transportation hub, it is one that lends itself to digital production of newspapers. The world is much smaller than it used to be. Cities have become more multicultural. Communicating with someone on the other side of the country is as easy as sending an email or a text message. You can have a face-to-face -face meeting without ever having to leave your home. Newspapers scramble over every available advertising dollar and the introduction of digital web printing has made it easier to expand their reach across the country and even the world. Let's say that there is a newspaper in Europe that feels they could effectively market an edition in Chicago and that there would, was a significant enough population of expatriates and or advertising base that justifies their position. Further, let's say that that is a multiple section 48 page broadsheet with some large portion of full color and a press run of 700. Who here would like to put that on your offset press? I wouldn't. The offset press just isn't designed to run effectively in those small, page, uh, small press runs and large page counts. The digital press is and it is as efficient at it as the printer connected to your computer in your office. Suppose you're a major newspaper in London, Munich, or Tokyo, and you expand, you want to expand your reach into the new market like Chicago. A few years ago, it would have been cost prohibitive to do anything except ship in the, the printed newspapers to Chicago and accept the fact that your readers are now reading old news. Today, it is extremely likely, likely that that printed digitally in Chicago will be read before the paper printed in its home city on the opposite side of the globe. Small press runs can be just as cost effective as large press runs used to be. And we now have allowed the publisher to customize the content and the editorial and advertising in both in order to accommodate the local needs. It's nearly impossible to predict where our industry will be in eight years from now. It's difficult for me to grasp how far technology has come in the last five years. Who could have thought that people would have a meaningful conversation with their phone? If anyone would like to ask Siri, I'm sure she'll have an answer. What, what I do believe is that the industry is at crossroads. There is no doubt in my mind that the printed newspaper will always hold a place in our lives, but what needs to be decided is what kind of place that will be. The statistics have shown us time and time again that people prefer to read print in communications, direct mail, and all forms of advertising. The internet has not replaced the value of print. So what is the problem? Where are we missing the boat? What drives people is the me factor. When I read news online, I click to the stories that are relevant to me. I wouldn't be surprised if in eight years from now, I could customize my own local newspaper to have those same type of stories, customized news feeds that I can create online. News stories and advertisements created from a single end user in mind. The way that we print is changing, the way we read is changing, but it will be our ability to adapt to these changes that will determine our success or failures as individuals. 
and as an industry. We purchased our digital web press because we felt that the market was at a tipping point where marketing departments would play a more important role in successful newspapers. The idea of being able to change a page or an editorial and advertising content in small increments will be driven by those who hold the control of the data, those who know where the market is and how to reach the market. NewsWeb is fully invested in traditional offset printing to the point where we are installing a new Gauss Universal 70 in the spring of 2013. We know that digital printing will not be for everyone. We feel strongly that digital printing will continue to grow and change the face of the newspaper and the commercial printing industry. We feel that offset and digital can effectively complement each other, thus providing the client with the best possible printed solution to reach their readers and their advertisers. Print is not dead. It may not be what it used to be, but there is a new era on the horizon. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we will have some time for questions and answers uh, after each of the presentations. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Marco Bohr. Uh, Marco is Vice President of the Consultancy IT Strategies. Um, and as the bio he gave me read, so bear that in mind, is the alleged expert on the next generation of digital production printers. Alleged expert because the expert bit stems from the fact that he is from out of town, which of course immediately makes him an expert as we all know. And like most experts, he's never screwed together an entire production inkjet printer on his own. That said, Marco has been actively involved in the tracking, research, and analysis of production inkjet printers since 1992. Collectively, IT Strategies conducts over 1,000 qualitative interviews a year in order to learn what the market requires for its next generation of digital printers. Marco? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chuck. So I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective on, on the state of, of newspaper printing. So I am not a newspaper printing expert, but I know a lot about digital printing. And so for the last 20 years, we've been helping to develop the next generation of digital production printing products. And of these inkjet presses you see on the show floor, we've probably had a hand, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, in about 80% of those machines in, on the show floor. So let me give you a little overview of what digital printing means, as in, you know, not electronic iPads, but digital printing using inkjet to get print uh, or ink on paper. And I'll try to limit it to about 10 minutes. First of all, so a pop quiz to get your attention, wake you up a little bit. Uh, but it's an important question because it puts it into context uh, of how big this industry really is from a equipment manufacturer perspective and, and who's making the money. So the first question is, how large do you think the total combined revenues of all the offset press, web offset, sheet offset, ink, uh, plate manufacturers, uh, how big do you think that total collective sum of revenue was that these guys generated? Uh, and so thinking of Heidelberg's got a certain amount of revenue and Kodak's got a certain amount of revenue in plates. Anybody want to wager a rough guess uh, of how large this might be? Ah, oh, pretty, yes, so, so. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> wow, home run, 30 billion. That, that's a pretty good number. Uh, and that's uh, it's an amazing statistic. So it's still a very large and rich industry. By the way, to put this into context, in the US, the pet food industry last year was apparently 60 billion, but okay. Um, the next question is, let's see if it will come. Here we go. How much revenue was generated by digital printing equipment suppliers? So, so these are companies like HP, Xerox, Canon, Ricoh, uh, Fujifilm, etc. Anybody care to take a guess how large that is? Now, bear in mind, this includes little, you know, consumer inkjet printers at home and laser jet printers and big, you know, Xerox production printers and so forth. Well, 120 billion. So already today, this little tiny stuff that you see around your home is generating four times as much revenue as the traditional sort of core printing industry from an equipment and supplies manufacturing perspective. 
So there's a lot of money to be had in digital printing. Uh, and that money is important because it translates into scale. Because in this digital printing world, you've got R&D costs that are completely out of sync compared to the traditional R&D costs on the offset or analog world. Uh, typically, a digital printer manufacturer will spend anywhere between 5 to 10 percent of their revenue on R&D. If you take an analog press manufacturer, you're lucky to get 1.5 percent. And so there, it's an indicator in part of the lack of maturity or the early stages of this growth curve that we're still on in terms of digital printing. And uh, I think it was Rick who mentioned this morning, two years ago, inkjet presses you know, were able to get through about half the amount of newspapers compared to what this new jet leader uh, device can produce. So, so the technology ramp up curve is moving extremely fast. So there is more spent today, by the way, on digital production printers than there is on offset presses and supplies. And that's another staggering statistic. So when you think about you know, things that are probably slightly off your radar, but HP Indigo presses and iGens, and you add up all these inkjet machines and so forth, that number is already bigger. And again, the point being is that digital printing is happening all around you, but you might not necessarily be aware of it. Uh, and that's an interesting issue, and I'll highlight another example in a second, uh, as to where your competition might come from in the future. Lots of data here, but let me give you the background to it. Um, we do uh, research projects in part for the National Printing and Equipment Suppliers Organization, NPES, and they've got a research arm called Premier. Premier commissions about six studies a year, and one of those studies we, we did for them uh, two years ago now was, you know, help us understand when digital printing is going to replace offset printing. You know, we, we see digital printing everywhere. You walk into any commercial shop, you see digital presses. Uh, tell us, when, when is digital going to replace analog print? And we set about on an eight-month journey to try to understand by 12 different applications the actual page volumes being printed, equivalent pages uh, of letter-sized simplex pages. And we went through this back and forth, and we had huge heated debates with the um, digital printer vendors in particular about the sizing of things. And in the end, uh, I think what helped settle the argument was the paper industry. And so we were able to go back and backwards quantify based upon paper weights and volumes and tonnages really what kind of volume was going out the door by application. And what we came up with is analog printing, and, and this is a worldwide statistic, um, back in 2010 was about 40 trillion pages were printed. Uh, and that's anything from newspapers, which, oh, by the way, account for about 40% of that number, maybe even 45%, uh, to books, to catalogs, to you, you name it, marketing collateral. Anyway, that analog print business is going down at about 4 or 5% a year, uh, year after year, going from that forecast period. Now, that's not insignificant because over a period of five years, we've lost 25% of our volume, page printed volume. And, and that's a huge issue. Meanwhile, digital printing is growing at about 9% a year, year after year, which is, you know, in this industry in particular, is a really nice growth rate to have. But what you can see here is that digital printing will never replace analog printing. It is almost running in parallel. The, these are separate markets. And what's happening is, is that these digital printers that are coming in are, are not able to do what offset does really well, but they do other things. And, and that could be short run, micro versioning, could be you know, reducing costs on setup time, et cetera. But whatever they do, whatever the value is, it's not replacing offset because offset is just so low cost, so quick, um, and it's really in ingrained. And the volumes are so big that you can't make digital printers fast enough. So key point here is digital is never going to replace offset. But by the way, offset is going down all by itself. Now, that led to another big question. So last year, MPES came back to us and said, please help us understand where are all those analog pages going? If we're losing 5% of, of all that volume annually, that must be going up into the cloud, right, in, into the internet. And so we went about on this other big eight-month study. And, and by the way, these reports are available from Premier, and the, the first one is 400 pages, and then the other one is 300. But they're really seminal works. Um, but anyway, we went about to study what happens now to all those pages that are being lost. So let me give you an example 
uh, of a, one of the applications we covered. Uh, and it's not related to newspapers, because I don't know as much about newspapers as you do. So I thought I'd pick a safe topic, and that was journal printing. So we went about and we said, okay, here you are. Uh, journal printing has this content and advertising. And, and journal printing is actually pretty good business still today. Uh, it's about, I think, in the US, about a $500 million business. So good size. Well, what happened is in the journal business, the internet came along back in the mid-90s. And all of a sudden, um, you had this electronic technology that was pushing back because the professors that were looking, or the students that were looking for journal articles to cite in their references, basically were at the mercy of a librarian's talents. Unless that librarian could help you wade through the stacks and find interesting articles that you could cite then, you were out of luck. And so the internet all of a sudden created this freedom to be able to search and retrieve articles really quickly. So that was a, a, a great thing, and, and of course everybody pushed towards it, particularly because you're in a university environment. So um, things move forward. And then along the way, we, we got into another little thing, which we call time compression. And what happened was it was a side effect, because not only could you retrieve articles very quickly now, you could also publish them much faster. And it turns out that in the world of research, and, and journals in particular, uh, you live and die by when you get a paper published. And so if I've been working on a particular fuel cell technology paper, and, and all of a sudden in China, somebody else had been working on a similar project and they published before I did, my research has little value. And so the, the authors of articles and journals started pushing back and saying, I need you to publish my findings electronically, even before peer review, because uh, this is a, a valuable thing. It's this time compression. So all of a sudden, the journal societies, and, and we worked with one journal society very closely in particular on this, found that by going electronic, their membership all of a sudden increased. And this one particular society we dealt with was about 25 million in revenue back in the early 2000s. Last year, they hit 125 million <coughs> in revenue, membership revenue. And the reason why their revenue skyrocketed is because they had liberated all this content and gone electronic. Uh, and oh, by the way, China and India are minting more PhDs than anywhere else in the world, and, and that's basically where all that new revenue came from. Great, so they said, you know, this old business model of publishing these journals doesn't work for us. We want to get rid of it because it's holding us back, right? Well, along the way, something interesting happened, and that was digital printing. Because the members, particularly the, the board members of this society, still believed that print had enormous value because when they wrote an article, unless it was in print, it was not final and it wasn't official. And they said, you can't get rid of printed journals. I want my journal. And they said, well, you know, these journals cost us about $12 a piece to print and, and we usually keep 1,000 in the back room. And, you know, my God, we have 900 that sit there for about 10 years. And so it turns out the inventory inefficiency costs were millions of dollars. And, and the $12 million a year they were spending on buying these offset journals, frankly, wasn't really sustainable. So they came to us and said, we want to go and look at our alternatives. And how do you do that digitally? Well, the volumes, it turns out, on these digital, on these journals are still quite high, and, and it took us a long time. We went to about 400 commercial printers and whittled it down to somebody who could finally figure out how to do this. And what was interesting is that the, the company, the offset press man, or the printer publisher that had had this business from this society for 25 years basically said, no, we don't want to go digital. It, it doesn't have the quality of offset and the cost is too high, you know, because, oh, by the way, the cost of those journals went from $12 to $65 a piece when they started printing them digitally. But the total amount of print expenditures that the society spent with this publisher, you know, which used to be 12 million, now are down to 2 million. And the irony of this story is that the company that got the new digital printing business is somebody totally from outside this industry. They'd never printed a journal in their life, but they understood content, they understood logistics and delivery and all these other pieces, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the old guy that had had this business for 25 years, gone. He lost that business overnight. And to that other commercial printer, all of a sudden he got two million in new incremental business, and guess what? Now he's knocking down all these other journal societies. And so that particular company is on track to maybe grow into a $20 million journal printer and, and beyond, all because they had digital printing. And so the point is, is as you sit here in newspapers, I think one of the things we're finding is that inkjet, obviously, if for many newspaper applications, not all, 
but for many it's just too slow, even at the speeds that they've got today. It doesn't have the burst volumes. But as you look at the fringes, I just yesterday had the opportunity to talk to a large printer in Brazil, and he's a transaction service provider. He prints bill, you know, utility bills and credit card statements and things. Guess what? He's now printing the London Financial Times during all the other days that he's not printing transaction statements. He's never printed a newspaper in his life. And so you're going to see new competition if you're a newspaper printer come out of left field from companies that you'd never even consider. Because you say, oh, they know nothing about finishing. They know nothing about all these other important pieces. But it doesn't matter because they're going to start small and they're going to pick up little niches. And under the radar, all of a sudden, you know, you're going to find that, well, we're in a different business. So digital printing pushed back uh, on the old business model. Uh, by the way, a little interesting aside, the content, which is already digital, is now also liberated. And, and you can get your graph that you're submitting as your research paper now printed on a t-shirt. Uh, you can get it printed on a mug. And oh, by the way, this is a little sideline. And, and you know everybody loves to have their work printed on something novelty like that. The profit margins on that are absolutely obscene. We work with another commercial printer, one of these big web to print providers, and um, they, they have this little side business printing on t-shirts with inkjet technology. They print over one million t-shirts a year. I mean, just out of nowhere. And, and they'd never printed on anything like that, you know, before to begin with. And so in a period of less than three years, whole new business. Anyway, so digital printing is growing, and, and as that happens, it's going to wobble back and forth, and, and the, the low-value analog pages, all those pages that were sitting in the back room in inventory, those are going to disappear. Uh, it's inevitable. Okay, takeaways. So, looking at your business, I think the way you need to interpret digital printing or, or the context you need to look at it in is it will add revenue and profit in new ways. Rod is on this brave new journey, and, and I commend him. He is truly a pioneer, and, and he's going to have you know the school of hard knocks, but when he comes through this, all of a sudden, the, he's going to be in business this that he never expected to be in. And you're going to find things like, you know, the things that everybody's talked about for years, micro-versioning, uh, game pieces, by the way, in Europe uh, and in uh, Latin America and in Asia. The use of inkjet technology to print variable game piece codes in newspapers now all of a sudden starting to take off. And, and so it's a new source of revenue. Um, promotional offers, inserts, you name it. Um, print isn't going away. It's still an absolutely enormous industry. It may be shrinking in certain areas. But the new value you're able to add using that digital technology, I think, will be significant. Second bullet, uh, digital print is not going to replace analog print. The numbers just don't work. Uh, and the economics don't work, by the way, in the, because if you take your traditional offset inks, my guess is you're paying somewhere between $3 to $10 a kilo. On inkjet ink, if you take the equivalent you know, volume on a per liter basis, and you went home and you took that little HP inkjet cartridge you had, and you shook it out until you had a, a liter's worth of ink, you're looking at about $3,500 at the extreme end of it. On average, it might be $800 a liter. Whatever the number is, it's going to be so far apart from traditional inks, and it will never come down, by the way. Partially, it's because of business model. Partially, it's because economies of scale. We're making billions of offset liters of ink. The total amount of inkjet ink, including all the home cartridges, is now hitting about 100 million liters. So the economies of scale aren't our. The, the, the purity levels of these inkjet inks is very different. The, the bacterial contamination issues are very severe. So we're never going to get inkjet ink as cheap as offset ink. Not going to happen. But it doesn't need to be. Because the real issue is, is that if you focus just on that cost, you're going to miss the forest for the trees, right? It, it's, or the trees for the forest. You, you basically um, need to look at it holistically and see where things like logistical transport costs come into play. And if you could, instead of having these huge centralized plants, have more decentralized plants, I think that's going to come back. These things always move in cycles, and, and digital technology is going to help. Um, I'll end on one last note, and that is we work with some of these large transaction service providers. And one of the companies we deal with does about 500, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. They're, they're $500 million company, but they do about 1.6 billion color transaction statements a year. So that's your AT&T singular cell phone bill and so forth. They have all that work centralized in one uh, facility out in California, northern California. One of the interesting problems they ran into as they got bigger and bigger, because they started sucking up all the work from people that used to have implants, is that they couldn't ship these things fast enough. So, so they ship out of Sacramento, San Jose, 
San Francisco, and they even have a UPS truck that, that trucks it out to Chicago, and they air freight it from there on out. Anyway, the problem is, is that they got so big and so centralized that they're now coming to the conclusion that maybe shipping all that paper that they need to that site and then shipping all the print back out isn't as cost effective as it once was. And now they're embarking on breaking that all up and going more decentralized. And, you know, who knows? Maybe that will happen here. It's hard to know. But the point is the real costs aren't necessarily where you think they are. They may not be in the cost of the ink. They may not necessarily even be in the cost of the paper. It may be all these other hidden costs. So I better stop. I've taken more than my fair share. Um, happy to take questions now or, or maybe perhaps after. Right? Okay. Thank you. Some is interesting points that Marco brought up. Um, our last speaker today is Rick Serkimer. Rick is a familiar face to many of us, having served as president and COO of Sometimes Media LLC and also a production and manufacturing executive at the Chicago Tribune. Today, Rick will talk to us about transformation, a subject he knows a lot about as he oversaw the restructuring of the Sun-Times before it was sold to new owners earlier this year. During his time there, he oversaw a dramatic retooling of the paper, including a realignment of printing and distribution, the deployment of cloud-based editorial and advertising apps, and the successful launch of iPad, mobile, metered systems, e-paper, community apps, and verticals across all publications in 12 separate markets. Today, Rick is president of Circumer Advisors, a suburban Chicago company aimed at helping newspapers and other clients facilitate transformation. Rick? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, no PowerPoints. But I am going to speak to 12 points, one dozen points of transformation. All 12 are reflective, as Chuck spoke to, and the most recent edition of their publication did such a wonderful job. And if you haven't picked it up, here's the plug, Chuck. You know, either on site or in print, find it, because the articulation of 2020 is about as, as uh, qualitative as I've seen uh, from anyone in terms of what a new model might look like for this industry. So in reading that, I called Chuck and I said, Chuck, I, I, I'm not sure I can do any better than what you guys did in the magazine. Uh, what you publish, the criteria you talk about, the strategies that are in place. So without just dumping it in his lap, I said, let me take a five-year window, not an eight-year window. Let me take the position of being a media executive who had a responsibility to deliver on certain results and see if I can't take all of you with me out five years from now. We're all together, we're a management team. We're sharing the results of what we started today and hope to accomplish in that five-year window. We're gonna reflect back from 2017 and say what were we able to accomplish? What transformational steps did we take so that we could make our local media house the leader in the market that it needs to be and can be. And so I plan to share with you those 12. One, operations. We found that others were printing better than us. They had more innovative technologies. And with many other publishers and marketers, we outsourced to not other newspapers, but to focus commercial printers. One whose sole purpose, focus, and expertise is aimed at printing and packaging of print products. We discovered in our early analysis that each of the markets we have a publication in, there is always a best in class who will desire to achieve a focus on our arena. And we must cease to consider ourselves best at it. We must consider our printing has become a commodity and our ability to invest the type of digital R&D is not in our operating budgets. These leaders became powerful print and packaging innovators in our markets. They consolidated the needs of the majority of the marketplace and its many local, regional logistics and media publishers. We now, in 2017, in October, print on fewer days the same daily product, but we now also print many, many, many segmented reverse publish out of our cloud-based content engine, multi-looks, shapes, and configurations. 
Not many that are much different than your Sunday insert package that you may have seen today. Targeted for specific audience, digital printing has entered into its full momentum in time, and we are using printers who not only do analog for us, but also provide our marketers in the media company the ability to customize. IT and software, point two. We shut down all our servers, and we no longer purchase software. We rent software, and we went to the cloud across every category of the business, including advertising, digital marketing, business system, HRS, and our product slash news systems. We achieved variableization of our cost structures and empowered our staffs, as well as our very large contractor and supply chain, to create and direct their message across multiple platforms, everywhere, anytime, including our new internet mobile, broadcast channel. Point three, our audience mix. 75% of our audience is now getting their primary content from our multimedia house via mobile devices of every kind imaginable. This is almost a 5x transformation of where we were just back in 2012. Point four, content and news. We discovered at Gra Graph Expo a series of new suppliers in the digital space in 2012 who were able to provide us with supply chain software that had a twist. It was designed to optimize the sourcing of local content to a base of people who our database has evaluated and can quantify their unique abilities. Those people can provide coverage and content around local breaking news community entertainment, facilitate opinions, and town forums. They have become our modern, facilitated, third-party news operation. We have only a few top news executives left in the organization and staff and on payroll, but that segment is about deep research and investigation. We've kept the very best so we can continue to shape the community that we're in, but we've also gone to a gigantic market of third party to provide us with community up-to-date information. Five, delivery of the package. We sold our delivery operations in print to a roll-up de delivery company called Excellence in CPM. These folks had acquired over 300 Metro and community news distribution functions and have since added multiple products into their channel. Most of those costs are variableized for us today and they can deliver a new late-breaking print product in a matter of two hours notice to household specific requirements. We said goodbye to trucks and honor boxes. Excellent CPM allowed us to do just that. Seven, call center operations, customer service. We're able to find a national call center operator that handles us and 450 other local media houses across various types of publications, as well as our advertisers and unique print subscribers. Now print less than 25%, both class circulation and advertising go through this wonderful call center partner. Eight, creative and business development. We created a local multimedia digital agency. We focused on creative interactive solutions, solutions that can be manufactured without touch or conversation, but rather all through virtual interaction, virtual interaction through the cloud. As a result, we were able to find and source ad production to two global locations, thus mitigating the risk of putting all of our digital baskets in one eggs in the digital supply chain marketplace. Nine, finance and administration. We were able to award all of our accounting and HRS to a third party whose basis is India. We have only a handful of finance and supply chain folks who monitor our performance and contracts with AR, AP, payroll benefits, and our ledger control system. Bullet, important bullet. We no longer have any capital budget anymore. Our suppliers take care of that. That is their responsibility. 11, our new model and our market position. We serve a very large community with this company that's now five years into its transformation. Our business mix of revenue is 50% consumer, of which 50% of that is digital consumer dollars. Advertising now represents only 25% of our business model. The last 25%, if you're doing your math with me, is our digital agency work and consultation services 
to provide communities and community organizations, as well as lead marketers, development of their messages, reaching the audience that we so powerfully attract through our many, many platforms and methods. We know the community and the marketplace and the segmentation better than anyone. But we also need to empower those partners in the market to bring content to that audience as well. And that has almost generated 25% of our revenue base today. Point 12, we are able to provide to 25 municipalities in our DMA unique minute-to-minute -minute live content, entertainment and debate forums for our audience across not only video, but as well as interactive conversation. We then, then deliver up to 30 to 40 customized print products to their door as requested by them in their inbox or to their porch or office. The only staple of five years ago for our printing publication remains our Sunday and Friday print publication and various other special editions. Now these 12 points of accomplishment and transformation have left us with a very small organization relative to who one may have seen 10, 15 years ago. But as an organization of expert marketers, content wizards, amazing sourcing acumen people, but with powerful influence in the local markets in both digital, video, and custom print products. But most important, our firm has a handle on the new business model. We have positive aspirations for the next three to four years as we approach our 2020 objectives. And we're not wringing our hands anymore. We're not worried about the future. We are embracing the future and have decided that our position five to seven years ago had to change. We are so pleased not to be wringing our hands anymore. The result, who are we? We're a virtual local media house. We have critical partners like never before, never before. We can influence opinion like we never have or haven't been able to do in decades. We bring people together into forums like we never were able to. We can spin on a dime with our organization because of our virtual supply chain. And we can make a reasonable single to low double digit profit margin. And we have more planned. Stick with us. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Again, very interesting uh, thoughts about what the future may hold. So we got about uh, 15 minutes or so, and I'd like to open the floor to any kind of questions from the audience. I think you can hear me now. Yeah. So how close can inkjet inks get cost to the cost of offset inks in the next five years? The answer is it depends. That they, they will never get as close. They'll never be on par. I can guarantee you that. We may be able to get to 4x. It's possible. But it all depends on the business model. I, I, I think the digital print industry hasn't fully come to terms yet with the needs to change their business model. Um, so we, we are still focused, you know, historically on let's figure out where we can get applications to print more ink coverage. So, so the whole consumer photo market was this godsend because it just sucked up all the sync volume and that was great, right? Because that drove top line revenues. I think at our side of the fence on the production business, that becomes a pretty painful issue because newspapers use a lot of ink compared to a direct mail piece or transaction statement, etc. And you're going to find out very quickly when you're running 50% coverage, uh, that cost of ink is just not tolerable for all but the high value pieces. And so how that's being addressed now is using some of the tricks you use in your industry already. We're, we're dropping pixels. So instead of having 100% coverage, we might only have 70% and it still looks to your eye reasonable. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all volume dependent. So, so once they scale upwards of 100 million liters and beyond, that's when all of a sudden it gets more interesting because they, they have some buying power um, you know, benefits that they don't have today. 
and the key thing is these dispersions that, that make the foundation of the ink. So. Another question over there? Jeff? Did everybody hear that question? Uh, Jeff wanted to know what the difference was in throughput between digital and offset printing and where the industry has to go to narrow the gap? Yes. All right, so I wish I could come up with shorter answers. So basically, digital printing today, in terms of throughput, is limited based upon the width of the machines they can make. And with inkjet, that's relatively scalable, unlike laser printers, right? So we can get up to 60 inch wide presses, and you will see some in the future. And then the linear throughput speed. So the linear throughput speed on a black only version, Kodak is now running upwards of 1,000 feet per minute, linear feet per minute at whatever width they can scale to. You'll have to excuse me, yeah. coming from the newspaper industry, I only relate to 30,000 copies an hour, okay. 90,000 copies an hour. Okay. I, I, I think. I, I might be yeah, Rod, Rod might be able to help. I, I have something too, so go ahead, Rod. Uh, the we look at our, our jet leader uh, as in a, uh, it's very relative to how many pages versus uh, the, the quantity. Um, the jet leader runs at 492 feet a minute, which uh, to put that in terms that newspaper people understand, on a four tab that would be about 15,000 copies an hour. On a 72-page broadsheet in five sections, that might be about 950, 960. Uh, so it, you know, the, the the higher the page count, the lower the the, the uh, net speed. So, to, to get where where Rod is today, you might see over the next five years a doubling in speed, but you're not going to see much more than that. And it's a real struggle, in part because while technologically you could probably go f significantly faster in the future. Market-wise, there isn't enough demand because what happens is, is if you have a press that can print you know, so much volume, you basically, outside of the newspaper industry, there's not enough demand for that kind of, you can't fill the machine. And, and so you're ha left with you know, maybe 10 really big customers who then hold all this negotiation power over you because there's only 10. And, and so you're far better off as a inkjet press manufacturer to look at smaller things, because that tends to be a much broader market than the ultra high end. So anyway, you will see higher and faster, more productive machines, but I think not more than double. And one comment about digital information versus the printed word. Our customers, we're in press automation, and our customers have seen a really interesting dynamic in that once paywalls were put in, and where you had to pay for online access, it was no longer your print order started to go up because the people said, if I'm going to pay for it, I want something I can hold in my hand. And what this is driving is that it's combination subscriptions mm -hmm. where that you get a discount for the electronic version and the print version also. Do you see mm -hmm. that this trend will continue or it will reach a cap? I don't think I'm the right guy to answer that because I focus more on the digital printing side, not the electronic. I don't know. Do you? Uh, I probably defer to Rick. I think he has uh, a little bit more overview on, on uh, I, I think from, from my point of view, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that we will see a lot more of the integration of, of print and digital combination offers going out to, to subscribers. I subscribe to a, a, a daily paper that I get at home, which uh, through that paper subscription allows me then access to unlimited site activity on, on their their site. Otherwise, it would it would cost me money for, for just the electronic version. Yeah. Um, to, I, is your is your identification coming from domestic or European? Domestic. Domestic. Um, I only draw back upon the industries, the newspaper industry in America's uh, desire to bundle digital advertising with print advertising. Is there some experience there we can draw from? Um, in doing that, I think we lost track of the digital opportunity. The numbers bear it out in the pie charts on the industry in digital. Our uh, single digit growth rates, the intermediation of competitors exploding and taking our ad dollars away every day. Um, I think large part is due to this, we want to bundle. We think we have a value proposition. I think it's right for some people, but I think we tend as an industry 
to put way too much emphasis on it. And I think the ability to market the content digitally and, and achieve the, the revenues that are available is a separate business. And when you start doing this, you tend to lower the bar. That's just one view. Well, that may come. Some have experimented with that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, that, that's definitely uh, an initiative that a couple of publishers have, have tried. Um, I don't know how much success they've had yet, but I, the whole notion of bundling digital and print subscriptions obviously is something that's gaining traction. And I know that some of the early research seems to indicate that people are definitely willing to go that route. They may not want to do just a paywall, but if they get a bundled package like they're doing in Memphis in particular and some other communities. So far, the early indications seems positive, so, so that's good. And then the other point I wanted to make on the digital press, Jeff, is that we may get to see, again, some proof of how this is gonna work in France when, uh, I think it's Rive, uh, it's a publisher in, in France that's gonna be using an Ose Man Roland um, digital press, and they're going to produce all of their papers on the digital press. I, don't, I think they're going to get rid of their offset presses. They're mostly, you know, shorter runs, but I think they're buying two machines. And once that gets up and running, you know, I guess we'll, we'll see if, if it does have enough horsepower to replace an offset press. Um, any other questions? Mr. Flaherty? Again, everybody hear that question? Um, just the question is, can well, ink, inkjet printers use cheap newsprint? <laughs> and the answer, I, I think, I, is yes. When, when you find <laughs> any newsprint that's cheap, please give me a call. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I, I think that uh, currently the, the inkjet uh, requires a, uh, a pretty technical level of newsprint. We're running uh, at our... Uh, office right now, a 48.8 gram uh, newsprint uh, with a brightness of 76, which is, is a significant uh, improvement over a 58 to 60 bright standard newsprint. Um, it is uh, quite a bit more expensive, but I, I believe that uh, the reason it's expensive right now is there are so few mills out there that have the uh, ability and have been uh, approved uh, for digital uh, use. We're, uh, we've had talks and discussions with a number of North American mills, and I think that once, uh, once we get a couple more mills that are approved, the paper, it will always be more expensive than a standard newsprint that you would use on your offset paper, but I think the price will be driven down uh, far more competitive than it is now. And the, the balancing, you know, I think the other side of that coin is you may be paying more uh, per ton for digital paper, but uh, the waste is just non-existent. I'll give you a bigger sort of macro picture answer. So inkjet ink today is about 90% water, and then less than 5% colorant, and then 5% additives. Um, it's a highly effective carrier water to get the ink through the nozzles. It's a highly ineffective material to absorb or evaporate. And so unless they start changing the ink formulations, and, and there's lots of development going on, and remember that big number of that 120 billion? That's funding all these new ink technology developments. Um, but I think ultimately the paper manufacturers are, are in such terrible shape financially, and their R&D budgets are at best 0.3% if you're lucky. That, that they just can't fund it. And, and they look at this and say, this inkjet business is just so tiny, tiny, you know, I can't afford to spend any money on that. And, and so ultimately what you'll find is, you'll find niches where people repurpose papers that, that maybe were intended to do one thing and then all of a sudden they work really well on inkjet. And, and you're gonna find yourself buying new stock 
that, that maybe was never intended to be new stock, but works really well, and it's a trial and error process. Right. So, so it's a long journey. It, yeah, that, that's true, and, and I think with uh, the more premium grades, uh, there is a little bit more flexibility of taking a, a, a 50 pound smooth paper that you might be running on your offset press, and there's a pretty good likelihood that that will run uh, adequately on the inks, uh, uh, inkjet press also. Okay, well, I think uh, we've come to the end of our session. I know, all right, one more question, okay. That's a good point. Marco, do you want to address that real quickly? Yeah, so, so the question is basically if you were to look at it, and, and the nomenclature, how we call things, by the way, is still evolving because when we think of digital, we, we purposely, in our side of developing equipment, think of digital printing. And I think we would refer to what you just called digital as electronic pages. And you're right, the electronic pages, I mean, you can't quantify them. They're, right, they're just, like email, everything, the, yeah. It's just it's a good point. millions and yeah. gazillions and, and so forth. And so content growth is exploding. You're absolutely right. But from a printing equipment manufacturer perspective, the percentage of pages that are then subsequently printed are so small. If you add in all the desk jet printers to that chart I showed you, you add not even 10 trillion more additional pages. So that, that gap is still hugely apart. Okay. Well, thanks again for uh, attending this morning's session. Thank you for your supportive news and tech. And uh, have a good rest of the show. And let's have a round of applause for our speakers.